Hey guys, Star Watch Media here with Helena Bonham Carter, the star of Burton and Taylor at Hamptons International Film Festival. So I'm curious, I hear that you went to your astronomer and they were the ones that convinced you to take on the part of Elizabeth Taylor. Well, she didn't convince me. In fact, I, um, but I did use an astrologer friend. A friend of mine, is, she's a really um, perceptive, really good astrologer. It sounds completely wacko. <laughs> But what she's good is she's very good at distilling characters, mm -hmm. and she really helped me. Originally, the re the person who really convinced me that it was okay to do it was Elizabeth's goddaughter, who was an old friend of mine. Mm -hmm. So I was, when this project came up, I just thought, well, can I play Elizabeth? You know, I don't look like her, and and also I just thought, what would she have thought? Would she have hated the idea? You know, it's the certain responsibility you have towards the person you're playing if they're real. Mm -hmm. And if they're not no longer around, so and Lil said, no, 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 should have found it hilarious. So I just thought, well, okay, I would, if I, I've got a sort of by proxy heads up, I'll do it, you know. Well, it's really a story, you know, about famous people and famous love. So for you, how did you humanize that? Um, well, the, you know, Elizabeth and Richard are so famous, but my job was to find out what they were like privately, and I think Elizabeth was. Um, you just do it like from she was fantastically human I mean she, she as I got to know her through biographies through speaking to friends um, old friends of hers through the astrologer through graphology my aunt is a graphologist who did her handwriting and I mean I just I did just did as much research any piece of information I was really looking for common th threads that kept on coming up and but the fact is she was such a great personality she was this great you know, on the inside as she was on the out, you know, and so many different facets. She was hilariously funny. She was a, had a really fantastic sense of humor um, and was very clever, very intelligent. But then she was, and she just had this sort of, she just was. There was something that was unapologetic, unapolog she was just unapologetic about being, just she was, you know, and she was also so sexual and sensual and in her body and so much a woman. Um, and loved, had such a great appetite for things. So there were so many different aspects and colors to her. That my job was just to collect as many as I could and stuff it all in there. <laughs> so what were the, some of the things, you know, given that you had an extensive research process, what were some of the secrets that you revealed or kind of pathways into connecting with her um, specifically at this point in her life? Um. This is probably one of the worst times of her life, so it's not the most edifying, it's not her at her best. She's at a, one of her most vulnerable, it's the year just before she goes into Betty Ford. So, um, she was probably, I stress this is all conjecture too. I mean, you, you're talking, William Ivory, it is a drama, but it's also not a documentary, or a, so a lot of it was surmise. But, um, so she was very vulnerable, but um, how did I get into it? I mean, the things that I go around there, I call them touchstones, trying to find essences of her. And, you know, I had a perfume and then I also, I mean, studied her voice. Uh, I had a voice coach and things that were so inimitably her. Um, the astrologer said something and a lot of other people that kept on coming up in lots of ways she'd been described was her um, liquidity. There was something that was so watery about her. She was a Pisces and water sexual. And so there was something that was, she just was, there was a looseness and a relax. So that was just very helpful, and her lips. We're just watching her. She very she was absolutely obsessed with lip gloss. You know, she's always redoing her lips. And um, then, then on top of that, all the vowels. Her she op her voice was very particular. Although again, that was liquid, so she moved all over the place because she was actually born in Britain, actually around the same place where I was born, which is bizarre, around the corner from me, and. Um, uh, so she often was English and then she was American and, you know, she was just, but you know what the great thing about her is that she just had fun. She had, she really knew how to have fun and there's little magnets that were all given, you know, or sayings to told to, we must live out loud and laugh and love and live, you know, she did all that. Right. A lot of people don't practice that, they preach it, but she yeah. actually practiced it. Well, and I'm sure, you know, actually starting to work with Dominique West, that all of the research came to fruition. Uh, so what was it like working with him? It seems like your acting kind of bled off screen into your your relationship not shooting. Well, no, Dom was, uh, we were, I didn't really know him and he didn't really know me before. So I guess we only know each other as Rich and Elizabeth. <laughs> he did say at one point, God, I don't really know where you start and she's 
begins, you know. So, but he's so good, and he was so half the problem with acting is that you've got to suspend your own disbelief, you know, convince yourself that. I mean, it's I don't know, am I really Elizabeth Taylor? But then he was so convincing as Richard, you know. On day one, I was going like, well, I think that's Richard Burton. And he's looking at me, so I guess that I must. I must be Elizabeth Taylor, you know. So. Well, I love that he said that, you know, it would have been more challenging to portray these two people not at this point in their lives because it is a tumultuous time for them when they're working on uh, Noel Coward's private lives. Um, so why did, wh what was important about this, these years of their lives in their relationship? Um, I think it's a very touching period. I mean, the drama. And i got to also say that like we did, both did it, not because it was like a biopic, you know, feel to it. It's just this sort of little chamber piece and a, and a year in, in a couple's life. And then you don't have to be Richard Burton or Elizabeth Taylor to have that experience of trying to work out why you can't be together, you know. And it's, I think they, um, it's them working out, I think, initially she wants him back. Almost certainly, I think he she wanted him back, and he couldn't. But it was all tied up with an addiction, and his problems, and they both were on various. And it, you know, this is what William's idea, to, though, too, and he, this is what he imagined might have been going on, because it was a very peculiar thing to do, in a way, to come back together again after being married twice, right. and uh, and then he was, you know, off the booze. But he, he, William was exploring, this is the writer, was exploring the idea that love is a drug and that the relationship maybe was, was kind of like, um, is love an addiction? I don't know, that's a, that's a, but maybe they were somewhat addicted to each other, but it wasn't necessarily a healthy one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. Anyway, these are just ideas of the writer and that's what, um, and I think, you know, this is too, it's a love story between the over 50s, you know, and they're not many no. stories for, for us oldies. and. Um, and it's elegiacal, it's a sad, it's an elegy, it's sort of, and about love and loss and a loss of youth, a loss of their prime. And um, it's a time when people don't really, I don't think, when people stop being famous, well they never stop being famous, but it wasn't them in their prime. We could never play them in their prime because we're too bloody old. So, but, um, but it wasn't, um, I think it was a more interesting What's well, a coming of age story, but almost a second coming of age story yeah, that people go through? Old age mm -hmm. story. <laughs> so I'm curious with, you know, Elizabeth Taylor, you were saying earlier that she had this great appetite. Like literally, she was curvy, she ate everything, she lived. Um, you know, what is important about portraying that to our generation that seems just starved and obsessed with technology? Well, um, I know the technology thing is a whole other thing, but the food thing is a big thing because I don't think enough people enjoy food, you know, and we're so obsessed with this, um, the weight issue, you know, and Elizabeth just loved her, she ate her fried chicken and her mashed potatoes and her chocolate and her Toblerone and her, you know, she ate. She was indulgent. She was, and there wasn't any, these days, it's so attached to guilt, you know, it's just like, Jesus, no, we should eat. At the end of the day, you know, when you're dying, you're not going to go like, oh, thank God I was thin. You're going to go like, oh, I loved eating those, you know, whatever you loved eating, you know, fresh bread with butter. There's a thing, that's a, it's about being alive and sensuality and experiencing things. And I think there's a lot of denial of life and experience that goes on because we're all required to be so thin, which is so boring and not actually particularly female because right. if you lose too much weight you, you lose your boobs you lose your hips you lose well i think that's why elizabeth taylor you know she is seen as being alive and that's why she's she's a story that's going to be told forever so congratulations on your on your film thank, thank you, you so much